We're learning about instantaneous rate of change. This is an important video and we are going to move from instant uh, from average rate of change which shown here that's our average rate of change diagram towards instantaneous because that um, helps us understand not only the differences between the two but um, the particular nature of instantaneous rate of change. And then this video will finish off with a couple of worked examples. So you look at simple examples first up. Um, if we've got um, a straight line there, we can see that its rate of change is um, basically the gradient. So it's, as we've seen, the rate of change is, regardless of whether we're talking about average or instantaneous, the rate of change is constant. So it's no matter which one you look at, in fact, it's just f of b minus f of a over b minus a, where we've got two convenient points a and b. So its rate of change is a constant. Then we moved on to situations where the rate of change is a bit more problematic, and it might be a case where we have a curve, and on a curve, the rate of change, like that one for example, is not constant and we have therefore two types of rate of change, the average again and the one we're talking about in this video, the instantaneous. So again we put two convenient points on but depending on where those two points are the gradient of that straight line will be different. If we put them elsewhere, such like this, that's quite different. So that's more problematic. It doesn't matter how far apart the two points are at either end of the chord, you will still find that the rate of change varies. In fact, you can show that the rate of change of a function is, is another function, especially in situations where you have changing rates of change. In either case, you can see basically that we are using straight lines at this stage to help us. I guess if we looked at this point down here, let's say this point here, we would probably get something more useful if we brought the two green points closer together we have the other green point there. In every case we're still using a straight line. And in fact if we brought these two green points here closer and closer together they'd end up on top of each other and you would have basically the secant or the chord would actually start becoming what's called a tangent and the gradient of the tangent is what gives the instantaneous rate of change. So on this diagram here it shows this and you can see that we have the function which is the thicker line. You can see that there, there it goes there. We have a point and we have an, a second point so that we can create a secant or a chord as such. And then if you notice that here we have at, at a point of interest we have a line that touches just at one point. So this line here touches the curve at one point and it's called a tangent. The gradient of that is the instantaneous rate of change. So the gradient of that tangent gives the instantaneous rate of change. Let's see if we can simulate that a bit. So I'm using GeoGebra and you can see the author there of um, this simulation. And it doesn't really matter too much what function we put in. I've just got um, a half x squared plus one, so it's a, a parabola. That's not hugely important. But I've used this one because it's reasonably simple shape. So what we've got is we can move our point around 
And what you see in blue there is the average rate of change. Now, you can see that we've got um, a certain gap there, so that we've got a secant. And if you make the gap wider, the secant gets longer. If you make it narrower, the secant gets smaller. And you can see the values for the average rate of change there. They change. So it's interesting that if I bring the two points there together, closer and closer, we, we get a different rate of change, similar to what we were saying before. And as I said before, the rate of change is not constant because if we move it around, it'll change as well. So what we've got also on this is the instantaneous rate of change. Now this, this actually puts a tangent on the curve. So according to this, if we believe this, that the actual rate of change at this point, um, 0.477 uh, on the x value, is quite different to the average rate of change. What, look at what happens but once we start reducing the, the length of the secant there. So I've zoomed it in for you and we've got, they're awfully close aren't they? So if we basically make the instantaneous, the uh, sorry, the average rate of change is chord shorter and shorter and shorter, look, look at the two numbers here, they start to merge together or converge as one and you get some very close values there. For the similar curve that I was showing you just before, if we have uh, initially the two points set up so that one of them has an x value of 4, the other one has an x value of 3, and if that's our point of interest, look at what happens to the gradient of the secant as we bring it closer and closer. In other words, when I say it, we bring the two points closer and closer and the secant gets shorter and shorter and the secant's gradient starts to approach something. And by the time it gets to these sort of values here, we're talking about something that's very close to 3. And you can see that that is converging on some value there. It's approaching 2. So the we say the gradient is approaching 2. Likewise, if we went to the other side, now that's not shown there, but we could easily work out the gradients there. So if we made the x-coordinate here, let me just put that underneath, so the x-coordinate just the other side, so maybe 2.999. By the way, the function I used, I should have said this before, is x squared minus 4x plus 7. It doesn't matter a great deal, as I said. I just wanted to use a different function to the one you saw in GeoGebra just then. And um, what I've done is taken a point just to the left of the other point, and we can see if I use 2.999, um, sub that into f of x, and we get 3.998. You put that into your gradient formula, and you get something very close to 2. So what would the ultimate limit of this be? Well, if we put the two points on top of each other, in other words, we slide those down, so that gap they're calling H on this simulation, on this applet. So as that gets smaller and smaller, wouldn't that be the perfect answer? Okay, because they're on top of each other. But there is a numerical problem. Basically, if the two points landed on top of each other, this part of the rate of change calculation would be zero because you'd have the same amount. It'd be three minus three in this case and you can't divide by zero. So we need another way of calculating this. <clears throat> so soon we'll come up with, uh, not come up with, sorry, we'll talk about this idea of a limit which is coming soon um, and that will take care of that issue. But what we're going to do is use this idea of convergence. Um, this, this one was convergence from from above and if I did that one it'd be convergence from a bottom but they are converging to two so it does appear that the instantaneous rate of change when x equals three is two for this function 
So the best we can do uh, until we come up the limit is to estimate the rate of change using uh, basically the same methodology as for average rate of change, just making the two points closer and closer together and using this idea of convergence. And uh, again, it's an estimate, but um, we can see that it's, it's a strong suggestion of what the real answer is. Like, look at the table. <clears throat> So let's try it. Estimate the instantaneous rate of change. Here's an example <coughs> of y with respect to x for the function f of x equals x cubed plus 1 at point 0.29 by considering a secant or secants. So we got the point x is 2 and we need to find something nearby. So let's consider then something nearby. What can we, we need a second point for a secant. So in our solution, consider x equals 2.01. That's close. Okay, so um, that's for, let's call the other point Q. So we need to find um, gradient of point Q for the rate of change estimation. Gradient of P to Q, I should say because that's the secant, secant PQ. And so remember we've got to sub in um, 2.01 into this equation. So 2.01 cubed plus 1 minus 2 cubed plus 1 for the given point. And that's over 2.01 minus 2. That comes out as 12.0601. So there's nothing written in the stars that says I had to use 2.01. It's reasonable. Could you do better than that? Yeah, why not use something closer to 2? Pause the video and try, and add it to your notes, try x equals 2.01. 0, 0, 1, and note what's going on. I bet you get a gradient closer to 12, point, uh, to 12 than 12.06 because the values converge to 12. Again, you could take the point the other side of 2, like things like 1.99, for example, and you'll see it converge. So I'd like you to pause the video and try that and include that in your notes. So in conclusion, um, Basically, the gradient of the tangent is basically what gives us the instantaneous rate of change. And getting the tangent is difficult. You can't really draw it by hand, but what we need to do is make our secant smaller and smaller, and we get, um, we get something that gives us a very strong estimation. So by making that secant or chord shorter and shorter and shorter gives us a good estimation until we come up with this idea of the limit, which is coming up soon in a video, very soon, um, that will have to suffice for us. So we're basically using the same method as for average rate of change, except for we're making the secant shorter and shorter or the chord shorter and shorter, and we can see our ideas uh, provide a good estimation and we get a convergence on the true instantaneous rate of change at one point.